norms on Baron algebra A theory. I'm lucky that maybe this is not by accident that they've decided to put uh, Magdalena's talk before this, so you, know, you guys have seen norms a bit, and I can assume slightly more. But yeah, so this was part of my thesis, and I, the goal is to construct this norm on algebraic uh, A theory. So b before that, so first let me you know, give some motivation as to why one might care about these kind of structures. But before saying that, I should say what it is. So all groups for me are finite. You know, so suppose you have a subgroup H uh, inside G. Then um, you know, in representation theory, you have this representation ring R H and R G. So this is the ring of you know, H representation and so on. Um, and one thing you might want to do is to understand, you know, this guy given some understanding of this. So, in a way, you want to transfer knowledge from here to here. And, you know, you know one thing you, you can do is, and this is like very well understood, this is the, the additive transfer, uh, also called like induction. And it is under, well understood that, you know, it packages into this structure of Mackie functors and so on. Uh, but there's also another thing that you can do, namely you, you tensor your representation like uh, in demonic many times, and that, that becomes a G representation. And this is what's called multiplicative transfer or, or norm. As we've already uh, seen in Magdalena's talk. Um, and just to just to you know maybe so I just want to frame this in a in a way that's a bit amenable to, to like higher algebraic um, treatment. So uh, so let me recall what a commutative ring is, or or you know commutative algebra. I guess. So on a Bean groups, commutative algebra is or a commutative ring. It is an abelian group R equipped with like a multiplication map satisfying some axioms. So this is fine. And for today's talk, I'd like you to think of these norms the way we package it as follows. So you are equipped with a ring RH for, or EH, let's say, let's not clash with this, a ring EH for every. Uh, subgroup H inside G. So these are rings in this sense, but you also need to tell 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 them how to like equivalently multiply. And the way one encodes this is to you know take the equivalent tensor product of of this ring E H, and, and you provide such a map. So and and these are you know. You can make this precise, and the notation I'm going to use today is like KELT G, like G commutative algebra objects. So the you know just as an observation, you don't need you don't only need just a ring, like one ring. You need many rings, uh, one for each subgroup, and you need also to provide this extra multiplication. So I won't make precise the you know integrity of the definition but you know this is how you should think of a norm algebra to relate to Magdalena's talk this is I guess the structure of E G infinity the most highly structured well, I'm not going to talk about anything in between um, yeah so motivation um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you two styles of motivation so one is a uh, bit historical Just to put in the context, all the things. Um, as far as I know, this was introduced by Leonard Evans in I don't know, 1963 or something like that, um, where he introduced this operation on group homology and, and he used that to his advantage to do some group homological stuff. As far as I know, in stable homology theory, this was first used by uh, Greenleaf and May in 1997, May, I think where they proved like a completion theorem for MUG and they used 
these norms in order to construct elements in augmentation ideal and you know, we'll, we'll see a bit of that trick, a variation of that trick um, later. Um, and, and you know, more recently this was you know, famously used by Theo Hopkins and Ravenel um, to solve you know, part of the um, Kerber and Veremont problem where you, you construct like a genuine G-spectrum using this norm that can detect certain elements <coughs> in the Adam spectral sequence. But, okay. So, from a narrative point of view, you know, this is why I mean, it's useful to prove a lot of deep and interesting theorems in the theory. So that's one kind of um, motivation. Let, let me give you another one which is a bit more mathematical. A toy trick um, where whose context is the following. So there's this famous theorem of um, Atiyah which is now called Atiyah or Atiyah Siegel Completion Theorem which says that um, you know Siegel's complex equivariant um, K theory, when you borelify it, namely you you know you you complete it. Let me just say this this thing, you know, which is basically you forget all of the higher fixed points and you just remember Ku with a trivial G action. This form of completion is equivalent to another form of completion which is of an algebraic nature you need a higher day completion where i is the um, is the augmentation um, ideal so augmentation ideal you can also write it in restriction from g to the trivial subgroup e which is also known as op this is that. so this is a deep <coughs> Theorem, which is used all over the place, and you know, over the years, many proofs have been um, given for this. But I just wanted to note that um, how it relates to these norms is that in Atiyah's original proof in his paper in, in the 1960s, he needed a technical part or ingredient. Namely, he needed the following thing. Or, oh, let me write it first, the wrong statement. So, the restriction of the augmentation ideal is not exactly the augmentation ideal of the smaller um, subgroup, but it is so after you take the radical. And this is somehow important because, you know, you want to prove a statement like this by induction on passing to a smaller subgroup and what you need to know is that restriction of this IID completion is the IID completion of restriction. So this is why this thing comes in and you only need the fact that it's equal after radical because you're passing to the IID completion after all. Anyway, so okay, it's a, a technical statement that you need and I was thinking about this sort of theorem in the context of like equivariant L theory and I realized that I had no control like Atiyah. I mean, I didn't even know what the pi naught is, you know, let alone to describe all the prime ideals. Because he actually used the prime ideal structure of, of the representation ring. But here's a trick that, that only works when G is abelian. So I think this is also, it's sort of, the reason why this is true is related to what Magdalena talked about just now when she had all these abelian um, assumptions. So, you know, if you just think about it for a while, the, the direction that you need to show is the following, because, well, the other direction is, is, is clear. You need to show this direction, so, you know, let A be on the right-hand side, i.e., you know, A to the N is going to be in the augmentation I do for, you know, for some kind. Now, consider the norm. 
So the norm is multiplicative, so I could have put you know the bracket here or here or whatever. So I'm not going to put anything. You consider this guy? One can easily show that this thing is inside the inside the big augmentation ideal. So we're almost there. Now taking restriction. One of the axioms for this norm is that there's a double coset decomposition things. So it's going to look like this, and you know you have norm conjugation stuff. But the whole point of this, and you can pull out the end outside. The whole point of this is that your group was a billion, so there was not going to be any um, interesting conjugation so this whole thing is the identity and so all in all this you know this product is going to be like a to the m for some number m and n so in the end you know you've shown that if a to the n is inside the augmentation ideal then a higher power of this guy is going to be in here So this proves used nothing. It's like super robust. You, you didn't know you didn't need to know anything apart from the fact that you have this norm. So this is you know another reason why you might know, care about this sort of thing, even though you don't care about the norms by themselves. Um, it lets you get away with a lot of things. Um, and I don't really know how to upgrade this statement to when J is not J um, <coughs> Right, so that is a story about norms. Now I'm going to um, refresh you a bit about about algebraic uh, K theory, and the uh, goal was then to mix this two words. So algebraic K theory, I guess, from the modern perspective. <coughs> And view it as the as a functor from the category or the infinity category of perfect stable categories. Those are the like idempotent um, stable categories. You can think of this as like you know finite spectra, and whatever. And it's a functor that eats a stable category and gives you a spectrum. And this is supposed to be universal, the universal additive invariant, whatever it is. So as we go along, I will explain a bit this word. Anyway, it's a functor like this, or um, yeah, so by the way, if you have, if you know some things about K-theory, then by this I mean like the one that involves this S-dot construction, like yeah. Valhausen style thing rather than taking group completion. Anyway, so um, one of the fundamental results in, in algebraic K theory was proved by um, as far as I know for the first time in the most highly structured way by Blumberg Gebner Tagorda where you know using very formal category theory stuff they managed to refine this functor to a lex symmetric monoidal functor from cat for tensor to spectra, uh, where here the tensor product here is the Lurie tensor product. And why, why is this a good thing? Well, for, for people who work in, in algebraic K theory, for example, it, it, it means that K of R, which you, know, you can define as K of perfect R modules, is now naturally seen as an E infinity ring spectrum if R was 1. Right? Lex is sort of, if you want to take rings to rings, it's enough to be less symmetric model. You don't need to be symmetric model. Um, and this is good because, you know, anything here, you know, in the literature, as you can see, anything here theoretically is always, it always hinges on multiplicative structures and like ring structures and so on. So this is like, 
you know, uh, an indispensable part of, of this whole industry. And so it is important, and that's why we care about it. And so here I've suggestively used this notation, Kelch G. And I hope you can guess by now that what I want to do is make all of this equivariant and put a G everywhere. And hope that I can then say that K-theory also takes G commutative algebra objects to G commutative algebra objects. Namely, K theory admits multiplicative norms. This is the goal for the rest of the talk, and I will just distill like two main questions that will guide the rest of it. Uh, namely, you know, I said I want to make all of this equivalent, so first of all, you better ask what equivalent K theory should be. So the first question is, you know, should equivalent K theory be the following thing? And I will explain a bit. Should equivalent K theory just be applying G Mackey functor on this functor? This is a product preserving functor, so it takes Mackey into Mackey. So you can do that. And in this in some way, it's like the most highly structured way, way to build a covariant case theory. Because on the one hand, you can also just take, you know, fun BG into this, fun BG here. That means if you eat a category with G action by functorality, you're going to get a spectrum with G action. But we don't really like spectrum with G action, we rather like genuine G spectrum. Because then we can, you know, perform inductive argument because there's a tighter relationship between, you know, the subgroups and the subgroups. So we really want to land in G Mackey functors in spectra, which is you know also known as genuine G spectra. So this is the first highly structured guess that you might make, and there are indications that this is in some sense a correct version. For example, this was um, the, the the formalism that was used by Clausen, Matthew, Naman, Moore in the Redshift paper. So in some sense, it is a correct the correct guess. But still, the question needs to be answered. Question two, yeah. Well, no. Does this functor refine to a G lex metric monoidal functor, whatever that means? Part of the whole work is to make sense of, of this, these words. But these are the words that you'd like to be able to say. So that is roughly speaking how, what the rest of the talk is going to be. Um, Right. Yeah, so okay. now I'm going to so that is that is the goal. Now I'm going to give you the formalism with which I've used to phrase these questions and you know, try to get some answers out. And this is a formalism of the categories. So or it's also known as parameterized homophy theory, you know, and this was the formalism that was the um, uh, introduced by Bawe, Dr. Jasman, Nadim, and Shah. I'm going to tell you just you know the minimal amount that we need. So yeah, the story is that you know parameterized homophy theory is basically generalizing somehow working over the point, right? Because if you work non-equivalently, then your you know the data structure of all your objects are going to be categories, spaces, and whatnot. So in some sense, you can say, I'm working over the point. If you're working equivalently, a bit equivalently, then you know you might work over fun, bg, cat infinity, let's say. Right, so those are categories with g action, and then there are going to be spaces with g action. But there's a more, a more highly structured way of talking about um, equivalent um, objects. Namely, you replace this base with this guy. You look at functors from the orbit category on G to cat infinity. And this is what for the purposes of, of this talk I'm going to call cat G. So this orbit thing, remember this was uh, also something we saw in Magdalena's talk. It's just uh, orbits and transit orbits and like equivalent maps. Um, 
Let's let's look at an example just to you know, fix our get a better feeling. So suppose your group was a cyclic group of order P, you know, o, then OCP is very simple. It looks just like this. And this is the point, so you know, there's a unique equivalent map like this, but there's also like CP's worth of CP equivalent map self automorphism of the CP mod P. So this is what OCP looks like. And so a CP category, which you know is common to denote with an underline. So whenever I put an underline, I always mean the equivalent version of whatever this is you're used to. So a CP category is going to look like the following data. You assign a category to each of these orbits. So yes, one can with some justification use this notation to denote like you're supposed to think of this guy as a CP fixed point, but you know that's just an, a suggestive notation. And then you're assigning one category to this orbit, and then there's a CP, so there's in fact a category with CP action. And because we are mapping out of OG or you rather have a functor this way rather than this. And so on, you know, this is what you know, this is what a, a, a CP category looks like. And I just want to emphasize the point that because of this, you, know, you can see that when I talk about G categories, I don't just mean categories with G action. I also want to talk about specifying all this higher fixed point data. So just as a warning, it might be instructive, you can give spectra the trivial uh, CP action, but there are actually two interesting ways to upgrade this into a CP category, which are non-equivalent. So for one, you, you know, you can just take the homotopy fixed point under this action, so spectra to the HCP, then you know, you compute this is just like fun VCP into spectra. On the other hand, you can also talk about this. CP matching functors in spectra or, or like genuine CP spectra and, and these are like non-equivalent so you know CP category really records the the data of like all these fixed points for different so yeah so that is um, this story about um, G categories and um, in this language one can develop the notion of you know, G commutative algebra and so on and this was uh, this was introduced by Nadi in, uh, in his thesis so, but because I'm not going to give you any precise definition but it takes a while it's not so instructive let's just take it up it's better. Before talking about equivalent algebraic theory proper, I'm going to tell you a bit uh, a piece of the story with just to set the stage. Um, yes, so right. So question one asks what equivalent algebraic theory is. We know it's a functor or a G functor, whatever. You're supposed to land in G spectra, but to, in order to have a functor, you better declare what the source is. And for this, I, I have like two guesses, and, and they are related in a, in a way which I will tell you in just a bit. But uh, put like guess one and guess two. Well, for one, you can make that naive guess, just take Mackey object. So this Mac G underline is just like the the G category way of writing Mac G. So this is really the this is really the G category which to the orbit G mod H assigns the ordinary category Mac H. 
Yeah, there's something you can do. And this is like the you know the naive chaos or something. But uh, yeah, you know, in this in this G category world, you can also develop the notion of you know G presentability and so on. And from there, you can come up with another guess, which I'm not going to define. I mean, not defining anything, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what this is. But I'm going to give you a result that will you know allow you to give you a way to think about this guy. Anyway, so yeah, there's another thing called G perfect stable stuff. And the good thing about this this guy as opposed to this is that this is the G category on which there is a natural, you know, see that means a natural G symmetric monoidal structure. Right? Remember because yeah, so in this story, right, once we have a G functor, we want to talk about G lex symmetric monoidality. So we better have a G symmetric monoidal structure to even speak about. So this is the one that has it and is you know, essentially constructed by Nadine. Um Okay, so in some sense, you know, this is the correct thing. But now I'm going to tell you how they are related. And this relation will, will, will be important in stating the theorem. And um, before saying how they are related, let me just spell out just a bit of the structures that are already available on GMAGI functors. So a GMAGI functor is going to look, you know, in particular, you are going to have like the G fixed point, you are going to have the H fixed point, and then you have these restriction maps and you have transfer maps. So I'm going to put F lower question mark. And these things are supposed to satisfy some double process decomposition. So F upper star, F lower question mark is equivalent to direct some finite direct sum that looks something like this. So it says that you cannot quite commute transfers and restriction, but you can do so after this decomposition. So this is very much the same as the one this restriction of norms that you said. By the way, this this composite is just you know it's an endo functor on CH. In particular, one of the axioms says that this one of these has to be the identity, and so from there you can collect two maps. You have you know you can project down to the identity, or you can include the identity. We have indeed these are things you have already. Just you know, encoded in a Mackie function. And then the, the statement now is that um, this cap of G, whatever it is, sits faithfully in uh, G Mackie functors value in cap of, which on objects with image those Mackey functors such that epsilon you know witnesses uh, that you have this adjunction and eta witnesses that you have this adjunction. Okay? So I haven't told you what this is, but by virtue of this now you have a way to think about it. So it is just you know just G Mackey functors that you can cat curve. But where these transfers are not abstract transfers, but they are actually like they come from an adjunction. And moreover, this transfer is both a left and a right adjoint. So you know that's that gives you a way to think about this. But uh, I stated this uh, I wanted to state this because this will appear in the in the pain part. So right. The junction is like it turned out to G categories or something? Or? No, that, yeah, it turns out that, I mean, the theory of adjunction, precisely speaking, is just the relative adjunction of Uri. So, yes, adjunction in the G category is sense, but, you know, it's not too different from the ordinary one. It is, you know, if you view a G category as, um, like, a, I don't know, co vibration over op G, then an adjunction, an adjunction is just an adjunction on this guy, but fiber-wise, you know, the, the unit and co-unit are like sent to the identity. Yes. Yes. So just 
Um, yeah, so now, yeah, having collected all the ingredients, now, now I can talk about um, equivalent K theory. And the main, I guess, the main theorem of today's talk, or main just because I want to refer to this in a slightly different way later. The statement is the following. Uh, when G is a two group, I you know the order of G is a power of two. Um, the following G functor and this is where I'm using this, this thing here. Also known as Jenin G spectra. This composite refines to a G leg symmetric monoidal functor. That is the statement. And the rest of the talk is going to be me trying to explain where this number two comes in. And um, it turns out, I mean, yeah. I, I might, you know, I might have found on Earth like a, a can, but you know, only time will tell whether that is a can of worms or an empty can. <laughs> you know, it will, you know, this too will come quite naturally in just a bit. Just, um, Could also be a can of something else. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have an empty world of can, right? You have all these intermediate cans. So, um, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> yes, okay, so, as always in the equivalent land, like, if you want to do anything, you better understand how non how things work non-equivalently first. So let me tell you the non-G story, and this was, this is this thing that I said, you know, I want to tell you how they refine this k theory functor to a black symmetric noidal thing. So you know, guided by the universal property that you like K theory to have, what you do is you unida embed cat perf into pre sheaves. I'm sweeping under the rug some set theoretic problem, but okay. You do this, and then you perform a localization to construct a category which they call non-commutative motives or a stable category of non-commutative motives. You, yeah, you don't have to know any motivic thing. I don't know any motivic thing. This is just a word. Um, what, and what is this L? Well, suppose you had a, an exact sequence of stable categories. An exact sequence just means a fiber cofiber sequence in this world, which is split. You know, means there's some adjoint, but let's not worry about that. One of the poor property of K theory is that it is additive, namely, you know, you hit K theory on this, you get a fiber cofiber sequence of spectra. Now the Unida embedding just generally preserves limits, so in this world it's still going to be a fiber, but it's no longer going to be a cofiber, and that's a problem because upon localization and then we want to stabilize. This stabilization only preserves cofiber, it doesn't preserve fiber. So being a fiber in this world is just, you know, super not enough. And what you can, so this localization is just going to force the image of, you know, of these things go to cofiber sequences. So what you do is that you invert all these canonically defined maps which are not equivalences. Okay, there's something you can do, you just formally input, in, yeah, invert this map, get this category and I don't know, you might want to look at the mapping spectrum from the image or spectra to anywhere this will be quite motivated, let me just tell you this this is a stable category, so mapping spaces are, you know, land in mapping spectra and the statement that they proved is that this whole composite is this K theory in that sense. Yeah, so the slogan now is that K theory 
is co-represented in non-commutative motifs by spectra or like finite spectra. Okay. Why is that good? Well, the Uneda embedding is just generally known to refine to a symmetric monoidal functor. The localization can easily be checked to be symmetric monoidal. And in this symmetric monoidal structure on this, this then become, turns out to become the unit because these are symmetric monoidal, so the unit here is spectra. And mapping out of the unit is always sim lacks symmetric monoidal. So all in all, you've shown that K-theory breaks down into a composite of functors, all of which can be you know, refined to at least a lex symmetric monoidal structure. So that is how they showed this, this refinement that I found. And now, you know, being a G guy, you just try to copy this. Um, but something weird happened. We, we should know, I, I don't know. I don't think I fully understand yet, but it's basically what I'm working on these days. So one of the good things about this G category is that, I mean this formalism it's not that it solves all your problems, you know, like it doesn't because there are often issues. What it does for you is to reduce the problem to one, you know, to some of the essentials of it. And we'll see very soon what the essential core of this problem, at least from my understanding, is the core of the issue. So I tried to I'll try to like um, copy that picture in a G way. So okay, what do we, we you know we can start with cat perf G. You know, so far so good. You can you also have the Unida embedding now into G pretty you know all that all this is okay. And you know, as far as my this is also showed that the Yoneda embedding like naturally refined to a G symmetric monoidal functor when you, when the source has one. So it's fine. Now I claim that there are two ways to do this motivic localization. And they give you a priori two different things. I don't know if they are in general the same, but let me tell you the story. So there's one thing which I call pointwise G non commutative motifs, and that's another thing which I just I call G motifs. And what are these guys? On the one hand, RPW lab for pointwise, I'm just inverting um, you know similar collection of morphisms, which are non equivalent in general. You know, in Kepler, there's a notion of split exactly, so that's not a problem. And we can do this. But now, if you want to take the the, the the issue or the structure of G symmetric monoidality seriously, you want to perform this localization in a G symmetric monoidal way. And a priori, there's going to be an issue, but what we can formally do is just to you know, close this collection up under the G symmetric monoidal structure. So G tensor closure of RPW. Again, you know, I'm simplifying the story that there should be like some saturation or something if you care about those kind of stuff. It doesn't matter. Okay, so by virtue of this being G tensor closed, the localization is going to refine naturally to a G symmetric monoidal function. So that so this is from the G symmetric monoidal lens from the multiplicative norm perspective, this is the one that we want to care about. And um, this is sort of maybe the first guess you will come up with. In any case, since this collection is, you know, just in general, just contains this one, you have a comparison map like this. If you have, it's fine. And now I'm going to give you the more, more precise 
a statement of, of the main theorem um, that I stated up there. So main theorem prime. So this breaks up into two statements. The first one doesn't have any like hypothesis, you know. And this is not not too difficult. So oops. Yeah. yeah. This uh yeah, let me let me give a name. Yeah, let me give a name like this whole composite from Catworth to NPW. Let me just write the ZPW. So you have this function ZPW to pointwise motives, and then you can again look at the G mapping spectrum from you know, genuine G spectra. This will land in genuine G spectra. On the other hand, you have this faithful thing into Mackey functors. And this is then just applying MACG underlying on the on the K-theory counter that I the non-equivalent point. And the statement is that this the square commute. So in this sense, the K-theory that we would first think about is co-represented in pointwise non-commutative motive. So this this root is somehow the one that people have cared about all this while. Well. Here I'm just giving you a formal thing. And now the second part is when this hypothesis comes in. And the statement is that under this assumption, uh, this functor of psi is an equivalent. Okay. So all in all, this would, you know, taken together, this would say that K theory as we know it, or as we expect it, breaks up into a composite of functors, all of which can be refined to a G-like symmetric monomial. And that's how you deduce like, this, this sort of more basic statement. And now I'm going to tell you a bit about the story why this number two comes from. And I think it's you know, I don't know, I think it's an essential part of the story. Maybe in the future, somebody will come up with a slick proof that you know just manages all of this, but you know, it's something I think that has to be managed. And the story is the following. So essentially what you want to show is that this saturation is the same as this. Right? If you want to show that size and equivalence, you just have to somehow show that this inclusion was actually like all of it. And in other words, you want to show that this RPW saturated is already closed under the tensor closure. So the tensor closure doesn't do anything more. Now, I, I, you know, I mean, one can reduce to the case when G is C2. For general two groups, you know, you just use the solvability again, which has kind of appeared in Nikun's talk. And, you know, the point is that this norm can you can break it down to anything and you know of course two groups are solvable so you always have like a filtration all of those quotients are C2 so if you can somehow deal with C2 you have like more of this done so let's focus on the C2 case so the C2 norm is a thing which takes an ordinary stable category and gives you a C2 stable category so suppose we are given an ordinary split exact sequence of stable categories. Right? This would then you know induce a map. Oops. This would induce a map like this. And by definition, these are the kinds of maps that are that generate this saturation, uh, saturated collection. So what you need to show you know, up modulus some reduction is that the C2 norm of this morphism is still in RPW saturated. Up to doing some stuff, this is what you need to do. And here's the problem. So by the way, it's being RP bar being inside this is another way of saying being a, being an LPW equivalence. 
Now, let's try to unpack this one. So, because the unidal thing is G symmetric monoidal, as I said there, you can commute tensor C2 with the unidal embedding. So, this becomes U of tensor C2 of D divided by C. And here's the problem. So, everything that is difficult about the norm is always about distributivity law. Right, because we are all used to the fact that you know tensor of plus is like plus of tensor, but hiding the fact that you know this decomposition is terrible, right? Like, you know, so it's horrible thing, and it becomes at least as bad in the C two case. So it interacts okay with co limits, but not very well, and so tensor C two of this co fiber is not going to be the core fiber of tensor D over tensor D, uh, C, but rather it's going to look like some push-up, C2 push-up product, uh, C tensor D, C2 push-up product, like this. I mean, I haven't really introduced things precisely, but somehow in this G category world, you can talk about taking core limits over diagrams which are themselves G category. So your diagram itself has an action, right? Because this is like the push-up product, you know, something D, and you sort of swap these two guys, and then there's a C2 action. So in this world, you can make sense of this, and indeed, it's going to look like this. And this is, this is sort of the source of all problems. Anyway, so then you can do something similar here. And it becomes well U of tensor C two D divided by well, U of C tensor D anyway, whatever, no, it's something, it's another horrible thing. Okay, what what do we do now? Well, we might not understand this map, but we can factor it into two maps that we understand a bit more. Namely, I, I just pull out this U against this C2 push out, which I've denoted by, you know, underlying um, non-union. It's not in general going to be an equivalence because, as I said, the Yoneda embedding does not preserve core limits in general, so also not C2 push outs. But at least you have a map. And this looks a bit closer to the right hand side. Factors like this, and by definition of RPW, you know, this thing, this thing is here. So this is fine. So in order to show that this is an RPW bar, you need to show this is an RPW bar. Because after all, being in RPW bar means that you are like a motivic equivalence. So this is a motivic equivalence to show that this is a motivic equivalence this thing is showing the best. And this is where everything comes in. So here, the crux of this whole story, if you don't remember anything from the story as you probably will not, it's a bit abstract, but here's a here's one part that you know, I really want to emphasize because you know, I mean there's a part that I've been struggling most with, namely from I was helped by uh, Greg Arun a bit, and he suggested this decomposition for me, which I'm very grateful. Namely, here's the point: you want to understand some C two push out, but K theory is somehow defined non equivalently in terms of being additive, which means that you take certain ordinary push-out of categories to an ordinary pullback of spectra. And the whole point is that here's the trick. And the trick is that if I have a C2 push-out this, remember the diagram of the C2 action. 
I can compute the C2 Poussin as an ordinary Poussin but where I absorb the C2 structure into the object this is now an ordinary push-up okay so ordinary K theory is defined in terms of sending this kind of diagrams to fullback squares of spectra so with this sort of maneuver you can then you know, massage that turn there and show that on the left vertical map is a motivic equivalence. This is roughly how it goes. Yeah, so this is sort of the essential part of the story that I think is going to be in any story about norms on K theory. You, you are sort of boiled down to the question about an equivalent descent for K theory, right? Preserving push outs is, can be viewed as a descent statement. And now you are saying that K theory satisfies descent with respect to some ordinary push up. You want to extend that knowledge to be able to deal with C2 push ups and in general, G push ups. That's where the main problem is. And in the last you know, half a minute, minutes, I'm just going to totally change direction and say a bit about this thing called SWOT K theory. So, there's going to be an application of, of the main theorem. So, and, and this is, I mean, I also want to say this part because just now Agnes asked something about co-free, non-algebras on co-free thing, and I think this is perhaps an answer to that question. I, I don't know, if I, if I understood the question correctly. So anyway, the question is the following. Does something like this, K fun B H C where C is a stable, you know, perfect category. Does all of this thing assemble to a, you know, to a Kelp G object? So this is the precise way of saying, you know, that, and by the way, this has a name in the literature, it's called Swan K theory, and it's important governance, I mean, and start to compute and so on. So if you can find as, as much structure as possible, that will be great. Um, so the question is, can we put all of these things together into a G norm uh, ring spectrum? And the result that I can see in this setting is the following. So I will, just as a spoiler, I will take this and then I will combine with the main theorem and say something. So by the way, this statement here and this perhaps answers this thing about whole free stuff this is the following so I've introduced some words let me tell them so Borgi for Borel stands for the G category which to G mod H gives you uh, fun B H capital yeah so this is like somehow naive or like Co free free stuff, and there's a functor called Borel fusion which takes a G category, forgets all the higher fixed point, just remember the underlying category with G action. That's this Borel fusion, and the statement is that this refines to a G symmetric monoidal functor. And here, the G-symmetric monoidal structure on this guy is the one induced by the symmetric monoidal structure on cat Okay, so nothing fancy. And why is this good? Well, the modification turns out to be a Boston localization, so it has a fully faithful right adjoint. And then it's a general fact that because uh, you know, a right adjoint to a G symmetric monoidal thing is going to be G leg symmetric monoidal. And why is this good? Like how does this relate here? Well, if you started with a G commutative algebra here, because this is G leg symmetric monoidal, you get a G commutative algebra here. And then you can hit it with K theory. And if you can show that K theory is G leg symmetric monoidal, in total you would have shown that K theory is, you know, such K theory is. Uh, as norms. You know, I, I should say that 
objects here look like well let me say that I, and this, this is the kind of thing that maybe answers the question just now you can easily show that g commutative algebra objects in bor g of any category is going to be equivalent to fun bg cal c okay so to come up with g commutative algebra objects here is like really not hard you just need to provide a symmetric monoidal category and then you give it a g actually in particular you know if you start i don't know like spectra or something you give it the trivial action it's of course acting g symmetric monoidally then you would have a candidate for g commutative algebra here which under this fully faithful thing you know will send to things like this fun d k spectra yeah so all in all it's easy to come up with g commutative algebra objects here and in particular that gives you that you know, this 1k theory has got norms. Um, I have three more minutes, so I'm just going to quickly say that this statement here holds in a much higher, gen higher level of generality. So the way one, you know, I was very confused about this for a long time, but you know, it's just, how, I mean, how does one prove such a thing? And I realized that, as always, the way one does all, any of this is to categorify the problem and then decategorify. So, you know, recently, of course, there's this, people always talk about, you know, microcosm, macrocosm, metacosm, whatever. <laughs> this is the kind of statement that fits into that. This is sort of the final decategorification um, of a more general statement. So, this is like totally formal and is true for much higher general. Anyway, so. Um, yeah, I think I'll just stop there. Thanks.